This lecture provides one scholar's reaction to the historically unprecedented rate of incarceration that has emerged in the United States, about which you heard Bruce just uh, speak. What I wish to ask here are an intellectual's responsibilities in the face of this situation, given the sheer difficulty of persuasive causal inference on key questions of fact, given the limits of our purportedly objective, um, excuse me, um, okay. given the limits of our purportedly objective cost-benefit analyses that inform public decision-making, how should we value a thug's well-being? Given the incentives to conformity that stifle reflexive and critical thought in the academy, <laughs> who in their right mind would come to the university and give a lecture like the one I'm about to give you? <laughs> Given the career concerns of investigators that lead them to frame their studies so as to remain credible within prevailing structures of authority and funding, Given the, that historical narratives are underdetermined by empirical research, with the result that substantive political commitments can masquerade under the cover of supposedly neutral investigation. Given that disciplinary compartmentalization limits the depth of academic conversation about these matters, there are few useful exchanges occurring between the ethnographers and the econometricians. And given what the sociologist Larry Bobo has called our American delusion, that we now live in a post-racial society in the United States where allusion to our racist past is irrelevant at best and evidence of disloyalty at worst. As you've seen here this morning, America's prison system has grown into a leviathan that is unmatched in human history. Anyone professing to love liberty should be deeply troubled by this. That incarceration on a massive scale has become a central component of social policy in the United States is a preeminent moral challenge, not merely a technical problem. <coughs> we are not dealing here with policy analysis. The very nature of the country is at stake, and our integrity is on the line. America, with great armies deployed under a figurative banner that reads freedom, harbors the largest custodial infrastructure for the mass deprivation of liberty on the planet. For poorly educated black and Latino men, coercion is now the most salient feature of their encounters with the American state. This is more than mere law enforcement, more than locking up bad guys in the name of public safety. Incarceration has become a modality of governance. It is social policy writ large and no other nation on earth does it quite the way we do. As a second line of defense, if you will, American punishment policy deals with individuals whose human development has not been adequately fostered by other societal institutions. It operates in conjunction with and interacts powerfully with social welfare, education, employment and job training, mental health and other social initiatives. It is a site for the reproduction of social stratification, for the reinforcement of various social stigmas, and for the reenactment of powerful and uniquely American social dramas. And yet, the ubiquity of prison as a fact of life in poor urban neighborhoods has left families in these places less effective at inculcating in their children the delinquency resistant self-controls and pro-social attitudes that insulate you that's against lawbreaking. As criminologist Todd Clear concludes from a review of the evidence, quoting, deficits and in informal social control that result from high levels of incarceration are in fact crime promoting. The high incarceration rates, I continue to quote, in poor communities destabilize the social relationships in these places and help cause crime rather than prevent it, close quote. Put differently, the relationship between prison and public safety is complicated in view of the fact that what happens in San Quentin need not stay in San Quentin. What are the responsibilities of policy intellectuals in this situation? That's what I'd like to consider here. This is a difficult question because punishing criminals is not just instrumental state action, it is also expressive. Americans have these last three to four decades wanted to send a message and have done so with a vengeance. Along the way, we have constructed a national narrative to assuage our fears. And we have answered the question, 
who is to blame for the maladies which beset our troubled civilization? Intellectuals have played a key role in this process. For instance, any cost-benefit analysis of our historic prison buildup needs to specify, at least implicitly, how one reckons the pain imposed on imprisoned people and those with whom they share social affiliation. Failure to consider such collateral damage in the development of policy implicitly discounts the humanity of the thieves, drug sellers, prostitutes, rapists, and yes, of those whom we would unceremoniously put to death. Yet it is clear that choosing the weight, if any, to be placed on a thug's well-being or on that of his wife or his son is not a scientific question, nor do the data tell us how to weigh any additional costs borne by the offending classes against the benefit of increased security and peace of mind for the rest of us. The data can only take us so far in our quest to identify ideal institutions. Not counting the cost imposed on offenders by institutions of punishment is a political, not a scientific decision. And we intellectuals, too many of us, wittingly or not, have become the handmaidens to a massive internal mobilization that our work has helped to justify and to implement. This is serious business. Punishment is rooted in violence. Prison institutionalizes the necessary, though always problematic, violence routinely undertaken by the state on behalf of its citizenry in the interest of order maintenance. Social control and the management of the unruly are one function served by such institutions, but social affirmation, the construction of the virtuous we, is another less celebrated, though no less central function. And this violence is not only physical. There is also a violence of thought and conception, uh, a violence of ideas, if you will. Key to this violence of ideas is the mystifying process by means of which the exercise of might on this scale and with this degree of inequality in its incidence comes to seem natural, inevitable, necessary, and just. Rather than becoming cheerleaders in this process, my view is that responsible policy intellectuals should strive to demystify, that is to say, to lay bare the underlying ideological terrain. The social formation of race plays a central role in all of this. Although slavery is a distant memory, the racial subordination accompanying African slavery casts a very long shadow. Urban districts like North Philadelphia, the west side of Chicago, the east side of Detroit, South Central Los Angeles. These are man-made structures that were created over the generations and have persisted due to a complex of forces and interests which range far beyond those communities' borders. Anti-social behavior by people embedded in such social structures may reflect personal moral deviance, but it also reflects shortcomings of the society as a whole. As a result, the rise of mass in of the rise of the mass imprisonment state has opened up a new front in the historic struggle for racial justice in the United States. That struggle most decidedly is not over. I'm afraid I must insist on this point. Racial disparity in punishment reflects explicit and tacit racism. These policies, that is to say, have garnered support at times because of and at other times despite their having such a disproportionate impact on blacks. In his book, The Condemnation of Blackness, which is a study of the entanglement of race with crime in the turn of the 20th century American political culture, the historian Khalil Muhammad contrasts reactions of American political and intellectual elites to two related, though differently experienced, phenomena at that time crime being perpetrated by the new European immigrants to the United States and crime that was committed by recently emancipated black Americans. Citing the emergent statistical social science literatures of the turn of the 20th century, Muhammad shows how the prevailing ideological climate influenced analysts to construe the problems of these urbanizing and industrializing masses in America in such a way that while the poor white city-dwelling migrants were seen to be committing crimes, the poor African-Americans migrating to those same cities at that time were seen to be inherently criminal. 
As a matter of historical causation, the structure of our cities with their massive racial ghettos is implicated in the production of deviancy amongst their residents. As a matter of ethical evaluation, the decency of our institutions depends upon the extent to which they comport with the narrative of national purpose that acknowledges and seeks to limit and to reverse the consequences of history's wrongs. Much evidence suggests that managing social dysfunction via imprisonment is now a primary means by which racial stigma is reproduced in the United States. But racial disparity in the realm of punishment is not merely an accretion of neutral state action applied to a diverse social flux the chips having fallen as they may, so to speak. Instead, I see it as a salient feature of contemporary American social life best understood as the residual effect of a history of enslavement, violent domination, disenfranchisement, and racial discrimination. Now, I realize that uh, talking in this way may imperil my viability within the system, but I'm old enough now not much to care. For massive inequality by race and the incidence of punishment in the United States is one of two things. It is either a necessary evil given the need to maintain order or it is an abhorrent expression of who we have become as a people at the dawn of the 21st century. Nothing in the data, nothing within empirical social science can tell me which of these alternative narratives is the correct one. So I am free to take the latter view. On the whole, we have concluded in the US that those languishing at the margins of our society are simply reaping what they have sown. Their deviance is seen to have nothing to do with us. It is not taken as a systemic failure entailing social responsibilities correctable via public action. This is wrongheaded in my view. When the socially marginal are not seen as a part of the same general public body as the rest of us, it becomes possible to do just about anything with them. What does this state of affairs say about our purportedly open and democratic society? What manner of people does our punishment policy, particularly in its racially disparate incidents, show us to be? As I see it, we in the United States are acting as though some of us are different from the rest. And because of their culture, their bad values, their self-destructive behaviors, their malfeasance, their criminality, their lack of responsibility, they deserve their fate. I wish to suggest that this posture is inconsistent with the attainment of any distribution of benefits and burdens in our society that could rightly be called just. In my 2002 book, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, I propose as a general matter that durable racial inequality be understood as the outgrowth of a series of vicious circles of cumulative causation. The social meaning of race, that is, the tacit connotations associated with blackness in the observer's imagination, especially the negative connotations, biases the social cognitions of observing agents, leading them to make detrimental causal misattributions. They have difficulty identifying with the plight of people whom they mistakenly assume simply to be reaping what they have sown. This lack of empathy undermines public enthusiasm for egalitarian racial reform, thus encouraging the reproduction through time of racial inequality. Yet absent such reforms, the low social conditions of some blacks persist, the negative social meanings ascribed to blackness thereby are reinforced, and the racially biased social cognitive processes are reproduced, completing the circle. As they navigate through the epistemic fog, observing agents find their cognitive sensibilities being influenced by history and culture, by social conditions, and by the continuing construction and transmission of, civ transmission of civic narrative. Groping along, these observers, acting in varied roles from that of economic agent to that of public citizen, create facts about race, even as they remain blind to their ability to unmake those facts and oblivious to the moral implications of their handiwork. The current policy of mass imprisonment is now a central factor in this tragic and morally troubling process. In my view, an ethic of personal responsibility could not come close to justifying the current regime. Accordingly, I have taken up the task as a black intellectual in the age of mass incarceration of advocating greater social responsibility even for the wrongful acts freely chosen by individual persons. I encourage my American colleagues to join me in this. 
This is not to say that a criminal has no choices, but rather that the society is implicated in his choices because we have acquiesced in arrangements that work to his detriment and that shape his consciousness in such a way that the choices he makes, which we well may need to condemn, are nevertheless compelling to him. In saying this, I rely on a conception of durable social inequality wherein closed and bounded networks, like racially homogeneous urban ghettos, foster context within which pathology and dysfunction can emerge. However, these behaviors are not intrinsic to the people who are caught in these structures, and neither are they independent of the behavior of those of us who stand outside of them. OK, now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about the black community's impossible dilemma, the black community's impossible dilemma in the face of uh, these developments. By saying all of this, but saying all of this does not exhaust a black intellectual's responsibilities. I see urban violence on a great scale involving blacks as both perpetrators and victims as posing a dilemma for black leaders and intellectuals. On the one hand, as Randall Kennedy, the legal scholar at Harvard has observed, elites need to represent the decent law-abiding majority of black Americans who cower fearfully inside their homes in the inner cities while drug-peddling teenagers rule the streets. And they need to do this not simply to enhance their group's reputation before the wider public, but also as a precondition of their own dignity and self-respect. On the other hand, these elites must counter the demonization of young black men in which the majority culture has for some time now been feverishly engaged. Even as they condemn them for degrading their community, they cannot but view with sympathy the plight of many poor youngsters who are not incorrigible, but who have committed crimes. They, these black elites and intellectuals, must wrestle with the complex historical and contemporary causes, internal and external, to the black experience that account for this pathology. At the same time, they must insist that, despite these causal factors, each black youngster has the freedom to choose a moral way of life. This, too, is necessary for the black community's dignity and self-respect. This dilemma is made all the more difficult by the reaction of the wider public to the threat posed by young black males in the cities. Many are frightened by and disgusted with the violent criminal behavior that, with reason, they associate with inner city blacks. Their fear and disgust has bred contempt, and that contempt has in turn produced a truly remarkable degree of publicly expressed disrespect and disdain. It is no exaggeration to say that black male youngsters in the central cities have been demonized in the popular mind as have no other group in recent American history. What was once whispered is now openly shouted. For instance, one conservative critic declared of white opinion, and I quote, the criminal and irresponsible black underclass represents a revival of barbarism in the midst of Western civilization, close quote. The objective basis for such a harsh statement notwithstanding, there is more than a hint of racism in the relish with which some have taken up this newly liberated racial discourse. No reflective American, black or otherwise, can fail to be alarmed by such rhetoric. What? for example, might the majority be expected to do, having discovered a malignant barbarism in its midst. There can be little doubt that blacks, even those living in dangerous communities, are deeply ambivalent about the trend toward increased incarceration of young black men. Those wreaking havoc are the brothers, lovers, and sons of law-abiding residents in these same districts. For most residents of such communities, the desire for retribution is tempered by identification with the perpetrators. There, but for the grace of God, go I, or my husband, or my son, they say. Thus, we find urban jurors voting to nullify criminal charges against apparently guilty defendants and justifying that action by saying that they couldn't bear to send another young brother to prison. And we find liberal black politicians from the highest crime areas arguing against punitive criminal justice policies, even though their constituents might be uh, those who would gain most uh, from improvements in public safety. These jurors, I maintain, are not fools. And neither, I believe, are the politicians rightly thought of as knaves. It is a safe assumption that these are deeply conflicted people who are caught on the horns of an impossible dilemma. 
the muted response of inner city residents and their representatives to their own victimization constitutes what may be the only remaining check on the severity of contemporary criminal justice policy in America. Were the residents of America's ghettos to demand in the name of justice and civil rights protections from the, de uh, the predation of criminals uh, who just happen to be black, then their cries would powerfully complement the trend toward um, law and order that already dominates political debate. It would be arrogant to attribute, as do some on the right, the reticence of these people to false consciousness. More plausibly, their muted response in the face of victimization is a direct and powerful reflection of their own ambivalence toward and identification with the perpetrators of these crimes. Viewed in this light, one can better appreciate the tragedy that's at play here, the tragic moral dilemma in which such people are trapped. In his book, The Collapse of American Criminal Justice, the late William Stuntz of Harvard Law School expresses concern over an interplay between local control, democratic governance, and inequality in punishment policy. Some have Observers have argued that the U.S. is more punitive than many countries in Europe because the formulation of punishment policies in the U.S. is more democratic, in effect. That is, less deference is given uh, in the U.S. Um, to experts who are insulated from the passions of the electorate than may be the case in uh, Europe, in continental Europe. Stunt suggests that exactly the opposite, however, is the case. That Race and class inequality and the incidence of punishment is mainly due not to some generalized anti-black racial animus, but rather to a shift over two generations in the manner by which crime control policies and punishment judgments are taken. Due to plea bargaining, prosecutors now exercise more power than juries do. Due to a thicket of constitutional protect protections, federal appellate judges now have more influence than trial judges do. Due to population decentralization trends, and mechanisms of metropolitan governance, voters in suburban and exurban communities have a good deal more to say than do voters in central cities about state level sentencing policies, even though they are much less affected by the consequences of those policies. More generally, argues Stunts, the law has grown more specific and extensive in the definition of criminality and has left less room for discretion in its application. Mass incarceration reflects on his telling a disjunction between the locus of control and the locus of interest in policy formulation. Stunts is saying that the ultimate source of inequality and punishment is the alienation of local urban populations from the exercise of democratic controls over the apparatus of punishment. As some pro-law enf law enforcement writers like to stress, these are the populations who bear the brunt of the misbehaviors of lawbreakers in their midst. And yet, as I have just said, and as many law enforcement skeptics have emphasized, these are also the populations most closely connected to lawbreakers via the bonds of social and psychic affiliation. And it's this ambiguity of relationship, this intimate proximity to both sides of the offender-victim divide, this wealth of local knowledge combined with keen local interest these, according to Stunts, are the essential ingredients for the proper doing of justice. For Stunts, hyper-incarceration and the racial inequalities that it has bred can be seen largely as a product of the political agency problems engendered by the separation of local communities where both the depredations of crime and the enormous personal cost of its unequal punishment are being experienced from any means of effective control over the administration of criminal justice. Now, I was reminded of this delicate and perplexing dilemma when interviewing a young, yes, economists can do interviews too, when interviewing a young black lawyer, although not fine in systematic uh, studies such as what Bruce has just described, this is a sample of one, but I'll proceed. <laughs> I was reminded of all of this when I was interviewing a young black lawyer of many years acquaintance who once served as a prosecutor for the juvenile division of the district attorney's office in a large American city. This young woman, let's call her Elaine, did not want her to be identified publicly. When first entering law school, Elaine never dreamed she would become a prosecutor. Like many of her peers, she presumed that the black struggle could best be pursued as a member of the defense bar. However, a summer in the public defender's office changed all of that for Elaine. Quoting her, I realized that all of our clients were guilty. Some of the most heinous offenses, close quote, 
Shaken from her naivete, she applied for an assistant district attorney's position upon graduation to serve her community by protecting the good people from the predations of the bad. After a brief apprenticeship, she assumed responsibility for a large number of juvenile felony cases that came into the DA's office. Elaine describes her experience as difficult and frustrating. She talks derisively of those little gangbangers, everyone black or Hispanic, who are both defendants and victims in the endless stream of shooting cases that had come across her desk. Quoting, it seems that there aren't that many good guys out there. Most of these kids involved in gang-related cases, both the victims and the defendants, are bad guys, close quote. Especially troubling to her is the extent to which the gangs would use the criminal justice system as a mere extension of their street activities. A victim in a case one day becomes a defendant the next, walking right out of the court to seek retaliation against the assailant's gang. Or a witness one day disappears the next as a sudden truce between the warring gangs leads him to forget what he first claimed to have seen. Thus, while Elaine began thinking she would help protect the community from bad people, she has begun to wonder especially when dealing with gang violence, whether this was an impossible vision. She also had begun to question how her office handles gang-related violence. Every allegation is pursued straightforwardly, even though it is ultimately unclear whether justice, in any meaningful sense, is being done. Quoting, they're just shooting each other and we're sweeping up the mess, she says. The more we sweep, the dustier it gets. Sometimes I wonder if we wouldn't do more good by just standing back and letting them have at it, close quote. But she immediately dismisses that thought. The scale of the mess, however, is staggering. Quoting again, I just don't know how long I can go on, staring into the vacant eyes of these children who have, without apparent remorse, done the most awful things. In one case, a 14-year-old child had used a baseball bat to bludgeon a parent to death. In another, Youngsters aged 13 and 14 collaborated in a robbery coup murder by mas uh, masquerading as petty drug dealers to lure their prey out of his automobile. And yet another, a 15-year-old boy explained his apparent senseless shooting spree that resulted in several serious injuries by saying, I had a lot to prove to his gang fellows. He was referring to his need to earn the respect of his fellow gang members. Elaine constantly lamented that, quote, these little gangbangers have no fear either of jail or of death, it seems, close quote. Indeed, Elaine found them almost indifferent to the prospect of incarceration, which they saw as a rite of passage, another step in their burgeoning criminal careers. Quote, they don't see any future for themselves. Their future doesn't extend beyond tomorrow. They have no hope. They don't respect or value human life, close quote. She believes that many of the youngsters whom she encounters have been abused or neglected, though she couldn't be certain since only a small fraction of her juvenile defendants' families had open cases pending with the state's Child and Family Welfare Department. In about a quarter of her cases, she reported the defendant uh, had an incarcerated parent at the time of the hearing. And she said that invariably one or more of the following factors uh, was present in the cases that she dealt with. Welfare dependency, serious behavioral problems in school, parental addiction, or a history of neglect and abuse. Elaine dealt with abuse cases as bad as any that have made national headlines in the United States. They seemed to be taking, uh, they seemed to be taking their toll on her. And in fact, she has left criminal law altogether and is now an employment uh, law uh, in unemployment law practice. In one of her cases that she talked about, several crack addicted welfare mothers lived collectively in an apartment with their children. Investigators found the children uh, left to their own devices for a number of days, malnourished and living in filth. One of those very same children later turned up at age 13 as a murder defendant in a case of Elaine's. Later still, after the boy was remanded to a therapeutic school to await trial, he had attempted suicide. Her comment on that was, it's like his life has already been totally destroyed and he's still just a baby. Yet if we let him walk around on the street, God only knows how many other lives he'd destroy, but I doubt that we can help him, close quote. Like other judges and prosecutors working with juvenile criminal defendants, Elaine believes uh, that youthful crime records should not be sealed after the child becomes an adult. She notes that this gives gangs the incentive to use the juveniles as shooters, since the penalties they face if caught are relatively light. 
Unlike many of her fellow prosecutors, though, Elaine is wary of the claims made by the police in certain cases. Quoting her again, there are a number of cases in which I go before the judge and request that charges be dismissed because I've become convinced that the cop was lying. Some white cops, she says, just decide they're going to ride into the ghetto and lock up some little nigger tonight. When I think that's going on, I seek dismissal and take those files right to the shredder. Police officers have way too much discretion, and they sometimes abuse it, close quote. But these occasions are not the norm for Elaine. Her views of the role of police in poor black communities are complicated. Sure, she says, the police patrol our community, sweeping these young men into jail, but those kids are doing terrible things. If something is wrong with our community, she says, then we've got to fix it, and if we did that, we wouldn't have to be concerned about the attitudes of white cops, close quote. What manner of people are you who live like this? That question is unavoidable. It may be true that black Americans have been diminished by a history of exploitation and abuse, which they have survived more or less, we have survived more or less intact after tremendous travail. But that's not the only truth. Black Americans are a people of resourcefulness and ingenuity and creativity and courage and beauty and wonder. Foremost, Blacks are a quintessentially American people. But the historical scar tissue so evidently manifest in the lives of these poor black urban masses makes their circumstance special. Intellectuals have a responsibility, of course, to tell the truth, tell truths as we understand them, especially unpalatable ones. It does no good to say that criminals are a minority of the African American population, though of course that's true. That there are good and sufficient reasons for their troubling behavior, though obviously that's the case. That others who are not black have also fallen short. These things are all true, of course, but voicing these truths doesn't change a great deal. Middle class African Americans must admit and begin to overcome our fear in the face of this carnage. We are afraid to go into these communities. We do not recognize these kids as us. The distance is great and difficult to bridge. We are embarrassed by their behavior. We pick up the newspaper with trepidation, bracing ourselves for a report that the latest crime has been committed by a black person. The silence is costly. All African Americans are connected, it might be argued, by bonds of history, family conscience, and common perception in the eyes of others to those in the urban slums. Black clergy and intellectuals and business persons and ordinary folk, it might be argued, must become their brother's keeper. This is not a substitute, of course, for social policy. This is not a political statement that I'm making now. Uh, many, of course, are already doing so, but even more is required. But dealing with the root causes of black crime may require remedies beyond the reach of individuals, certainly will require remedies beyond the reach of individuals, families, or ethnic collectivities. Talk of root causes has become a pejorative in some quarters in the U.S. It is said with a sneer as if the only reason to think about the fundamental sources of criminal behavior are exculpatory, that is, to relieve a perpetrator of responsibility for his wrongful act. But if one wants to do more than simply lock them up and throw away the key, it is essential to think about root causes. If, on the other hand, one is looking to fix blame for the unlovely character of one's civilization, on a pathologically deficient element of the population, then thinking deeply about causation can only get in the way. There are individual, communal, and social responsibilities involved here. Persons must be held accountable for their wrongful acts by the state. That they act under myriad influences beyond their control cannot be allowed to cancel their accountability. Families and communities are, to some considerable degree, also responsible for the behavior of their children. The task of socializing a child is inescapably a familial and communal task, one which can be aided only in the crudest way by government action. But in the end, there is no escaping the need for social action mediated by government and politics in which resources are mobilized in the public sector to help meet the needs of the indigent. We can argue, and we will of course, about how this is to be done and what should be the extent of such social provision. But a decent society cannot tolerate with indifference the kind of deprivation that is to be observed routinely and on a daily basis in the lower reaches of the American social order. Finally, allow me to observe that the incarcerated and their families 
are not passive in their alienation. Rather, they construct meaningful worlds for themselves amidst the storm. They truck up to the prison to visit a kid or a parent or a partner going through a rite of passage that is soon enough to become familiar. They bail someone out knowing the money could be lost. To save their own hides, they turn their loved ones into the cops. They live with relatives who steal from them. They are one and the same persons and at the same time victims as well as perpetrators. The political dichotomy of us versus them is morally fraught. Any one of us falls, depending on the day, or indeed the hour of the day, to one side or another of that divide. A biographic life may be lived to either side of the line, but the imagined life, having staggered back and forth across that line many times over its course, can still be seen as unified in its righteousness and justified in its condemnations. In this regard, I know whereof I speak. As it happens, I have passed through the courtroom and the jailhouse on my way to this distinguished podium. I have sat in the visitor's room at a state prison. I have known personally and intimately men and women who live their entire lives with one foot to either side of the law. And in my mind's eye, I can envision voiceless and despairing people, perpetrators and victims alike, who would hope I might represent them on an occasion such as this. I know that these revelations could discredit me in some quarters. Some may assume that I am siding with the thug and not with victims of senseless violence. And truth be told, some would assume that no matter what I might say here, so deeply entrenched is that binary opposition in the American public mind. So I will not bother to deny or refute the charge. Five years ago, I was invited to give the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Stanford. These lectures, lectures marked an important moment for me on the long and ongoing trajectory that has joined my lived experience to my scholarship and my politics. Entitled Racial Stigma, Mass Incarceration, and American Values, those lectures brimmed with moral passion and what I hope was seen to be rigorous analysis. The lectures asserted what I have said here today, that the number of black men incarcerated in US prisons and jails reflects the social dishonor to which African Americans are still subject today, a dishonor with its roots in our history of slavery. I have not recounted the substance of that argument at any length here. My talk with some commentaries was published as a small book by the MIT Press in 2008. What I wish to declare here uh, this, af this afternoon or this morning, um, and speaking only for myself, is that I have indeed committed myself to doing something about this. In addition to teaching and writing, I've testified before Congress and helped launch a study of the causes and consequences of high rates of incarceration in the United States that proceeds now under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences. I see this work as discharging a personal responsibility. This issue has propelled me once again into a role that I flirted with throughout my career, that of public intellectual. Of course, as an economist, my work is to crunch numbers, or at least to be on intimately familiar terms with the labors of those who do. But what the numbers have revealed has staggered, has triggered my moral outrage. In this, I make no apologies. Crunching numbers is not all there is to the intellectual life. I am determined to reach beyond science and policy analysis and within the limits of my abilities to address deeper questions. My journey to the issue of prisons has taken unlikely twists and turns. It has involved not just the courthouse and the jailhouse, but my many years as a conservative pundit. It has included a religious rebirth, followed by a repudiation of that religion, and then, as if to prove that God had a sense of humor, a re-embrace of it yet again. And it has brought me, finally, to, well, the far left of the American political spectrum. I am the eldest of two children raised after an early divorce by a single mom. I grew up on Chicago's South Side in the 1950s and the 1960s. Although the neighborhood was rough, my family was comfortable enough. My father was a high-level administrator with the Internal Revenue Service at the end of his career, and my mother uh, worked as a secretary with the Veterans Administration. I had cousins who became doctors and lawyers. I also had relatives who died of drug overdoses or spent years in prison. 
In his book, Code of the Streets, the ethnographer Elijah Anderson describes two broad categories of social orientation in inner cities, what he calls decent families who tend to be working poor uh, and who value self-reliance, hard work, education, and church, and so-called street families whom Anderson depicts as having turned to lawlessness to make ends meet and violence to settle conflicts. My family had a little bit of both, sometimes in a single person. I'm thinking of my great aunts, Aunt Cammie and Aunt Rosetta, who sold stolen goods as a regular course of events from their basements or their back porches. They had these young women who were shoplifting clothing and foodstuffs from retailers. Um, and they would get 20 cents or 30 cents on the dollar, these women, from my aunts, who would then turn around with their big freezers in the basement in their huge closets and store these stolen goods and then market them to their relatives and friends and neighbors. So that if you wanted in my family to have a big party, you knew that you didn't go to the grocery store to buy your hams and your turkeys. Rather, you went to Aunt Cammy or Aunt Rosetta. And yet these were church women. They would go out on Sunday mornings wearing these big hats and get into these 1960s era cars with the tail fins and such and drive themselves off to their churches. They were the salt of the earth, these people. But that is what they did. So racial identity was of primary importance in the Chicago of my youth. White flight had turned many of the city's neighborhoods into African-American enclaves. And the civil rights and black power movements had fired up black young people, myself included. Yes, I was a young person once. Um, even as my political approach to the race problem has veered sharply from left to right to center and back to left again, my foundational belief has remained consistent. I am a black intellectual, and I will meet my responsibilities. Perhaps then you can understand why it is that I've spoken to you as I have today. Thank you. have some time for, uh, for comments and, and for questions before we break. Kat. So when we were in uh, Canberra, we heard uh, 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 one of the speakers talk about the increasing um, segregation of poverty and social problems in Australia. And um, if some, if you mentioned, uh, you used the words uh, massive urban ghettos uh, yep. when you spoke, which really struck me. Some, someone asked me recently, gee, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could do anything you wanted to about the problems you study, what would it be? And I said, I would end racial and economic and residential segregation. So I just wanted to get your reaction to that and see what you thought. Um, so there's a, a political philosopher named Elizabeth Anderson at the University of Michigan who has a book out called The Imperative of Integration. And she makes in a sustained way just this kind of argument that at the root of persistent social inequality along racial lines in the United States is this networking phenomenon of um, isolation, separation, segregation, both in physical location, in schooling, in networks of social affiliation, and so on. And uh, she, while not being an empirical social scientist, amasses from the you know, literature um, a fair amount of evidence to support her view, I agree with it strongly. If you could do one thing, you'd end residential segregation. Well, you know, that's a whole lot, e you know, from your lips to God's ears. I mean, that's a whole lot easier said than it would be done. Uh, what are the viable means by which one might uh, accomplish that end over uh, in a sort of stable way that becomes that are politically um, implementable uh, becomes a hard question. But yeah. Um, I'm actually wondering, as Americans live abroad for like 12 years, something that's completely subjective. I feel that in the past three, five years, there seems we talk about this binary perspective. It seems to me that it's getting worse, and that Americans are becoming increasingly divided when it comes to issues of race, class. Um, and for some reason, always found herself in the political left of things and trying to think, think of a way in which public policies and social policies might alleviate some of these issues. I found particularly the discussion of Obamacare and things like this really just riles everyone up and lays bare that binary perspective. 
I'm wondering if you feel the same way, if it feels that it's getting worse, that people are increasingly becoming polarized in the United States in the views about race and class and the issues that we're actually looking at. I don't know if I'm in a position to pronounce any meaningful way on what the trends might be. I mean, I think that's an empirical question about people's uh, attitudes that there are survey researchers who, who do investigate. Um, I do have the impression that the consensus in this is, this is uh, the kind of thing that I mentioned Larry Bobo briefly in my talk, the sociologist at Harvard, the kind of thing that he works on. My impression of this literature, and people here who know more than I can correct this, is that while the trend superficially would suggest a, uh, a you know, trend, secular trend over the last half century of dramatic uh, reduction in this kind of polarization and uh, increasing liberalization of racial attitudes in the majority population, that um, ideologies that promote racial inequality nevertheless have a strong hold on people. For, so for example, this causal misattribution in which we uh, understand people's uh, marginality and, and social subordination as mainly a consequence of their own failure to live up to our ideals about hard work and decency and so on, and where people can't see the causal role that's played by labor market institutions or the structures of the society and so forth. You know, this is a sort of new kind of uh, racial antipathy that people can hide. Uh, under the cover of, oh, of course I don't mind if, you know, someone moves next door and I, I see no problem with there being an African-American president, but, you know, still, those people on the wrong side of the tracks are bad people and I don't want them anywhere near my kids, this kind of thing. Um, I, I think polarization in political opinion in the U.S. has probably sharpened, again, I don't have a firm empirical basis for the claim, but it's my impression, uh, but I wouldn't only ascribe that to racial attitude, I, you know, I think the talk radio, uh, you know, the, the way which people get their news these days, the um, um, advent of, uh, you know, the, the Fox News Channel and uh, this kind of thing in U.S. politics and of the counterparts to that on the right and of people sort of segregating themselves and the sources that they go to to get affirmation of their own pre-existing beliefs by looking only at this website or at that news source and so on probably has promoted polarization. That's not an original observation of mine. That's something that everyone is saying nowadays. But um, that's, that's why. We do have an African-American president. <laughs> he was reelected handsomely. <laughs> okay, so that must count for something, mustn't it? Um, I think uh, maybe Lorraine and then Paul. Oh, hi, Lane. Um, hi. One of the um, uh, arguments that you've made is that uh, the racial inequalities in imprisonment is started with, from that perspective. Um, is this new front in the um, fight for, um, for equality. And you've woven some very nice threads through, um, uh, through your talk, but one, what I would consider pretty hefty rope that sort of comes into this, um, uh, this discussion is the issue of the crack cocaine epidemic. Yeah. and the war on drugs, yeah. which is so fundamental to what we're talking about, and to uh, to not focus in as a fairly major, I'm, I'm not suggesting it's the only thing, but there's um, you know, such a major part of this, um, yeah. uh, of the rise in incarceration and the incarceration of a whole generation of young black men. So can you sort of reflect your views about the crack cocaine epidemic and the, the war on drugs into this conversation? Sure, sure. I, I was uh, remiss in not explicitly making some mention about um, drug control policy and the racial uh, difference in the incidence of the cost and so forth. And so when crack cocaine epidemic thankfully has subsided, but the war on drugs is uh, still going on strong, and um, as Bruce and many other experts would tell you, it is a uh, you know, quantitatively significant factor in this, uh, the uh, you know, emergence of this regime of uh, incarceration and in the racial disparity in the, in the uh, scale of uh, incarceration. Um, things may be changing a bit. The debate about drug control policy seems to be opening up. Uh, states are legal, some states are legalizing uh, cannabis, for example, or decriminalizing it, and um, uh, 
other uh, political developments suggesting that there may be some scope for backing off at least to some degree from the war on drugs, but we're still well down that path. Uh, we have remained well down that path under the administration of President Obama and the African American Attorney General Eric Holder in the United States. People are not publicly backing off from that. Um, there's a popular book that's done very well in the United States the last uh, couple of years called uh, The New Jim Crow by a woman named Michelle Alexander, which I think makes this narrative, uh, you know, sort of advances this narrative about the role of drug control policy in the uh, at rise of mass incarceration and its racial disparity uh, very effectively. Um, Bruce mentioned uh, early in his talk, when, uh, in, after the talk, in one of the early questions, when asked how is it that things have come to this pass, he says there are political and economic reasons, the political reasons emerging out of the post-60s environment and, and reaction, maybe backlash against some of the assertiveness of African Americans and leading to a more law, law and order sensibility, especially on the right of the American politics. And I think that that uh, sentiment uh, is reflected to some degree in the tenacity with which we have clung to the war on drugs, notwithstanding what I regard as fairly compelling evidence that it hasn't been uh, at all effective at what's supposed to have been the objective, which is uh, keeping our children free from drugs. I mean, the price of quality adjusted price of illicit substances on American streets has fallen straight down for 20 years. The whole idea of a drug control regime, which punitive, is to force the price up so that people will be using less of it, but the stuff is still getting through. Uh, drug use is widespread, and not only in inner cities, or not even mainly in inner cities, there's huge racial disparity in the just mechanics of the administration of the war on drugs. I mean, the police are not raiding dorm rooms to find out that my students at Brown University are snorting cocaine or heroin or, or smoking dope, even though they are. Um, but they are bad, you know, using <coughs> rams to batter down the doors of inner city tenements to find uh, the drug sellers who are behind there. Um, it strikes me that at a kind of what a social philosophic level, there, there are deep questions because the commerce in illicit substances is driven by the demand side. I mean, you wouldn't have a market if people weren't wanting to use these substances. And the demand is very ecumenical across class and race. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are using illicit substances. On the supply side, though, you would, I think, predict that the participants in the illicit traffic in the black market are going to be people whose outside options, whose alternative opportunities are relatively scant. They're the ones who are going to find it um, a, a rational decision to elect to take risk and participate in this traffic. So we have a demand driven by kind of the broad middle of the society creating a market in which the people who end up on the supply side of that market and who bear the brunt of the punitive reaction to the entire thing come largely from the disadvantaged quarters of society and they're going to be disproportionately black and brown. Uh, so um, I don't know what that comes to at the end of the day, but uh, those are a few reflections or observations about the war on drugs which would figure prominently in my uh, full understanding of how it is that we've gotten to this pass. Um, putting aside the potential to make the phone call to Jesus or the phone call to Barack Obama, um, do you, can you comment on whether there are possibilities for social scientists to get involved in holistic planning about these things in the USA? Uh, do, do you get, I mean, you, the elephant in the room is you haven't heard your solutions. I'm wondering in a practical sense, but is there a way? Are there opportunities to get involved in strategic planning with government at various tiers in the USA? I'm, I'm probably not the best qualified person to react to that, being a, you know, sort of <coughs> ivory tower type who doesn't have a whole lot of practical interaction with policymakers. I would imagine that it would be at the state and local level where those opportunities might be most, uh, you know, powerfully present. Um, where uh, you could get involved in policy reform dynamics in a governor's office or in a police department or whatever. But this is not the kind of thing that I know a great deal about. For my own part, I'm sitting on a very comfortable uh, panel that uh, they f we fly into Washington every three or four months. We sit around in a nice hotel. We have good wine at dinner. And uh, we're going to issue a report. Now, I know that that may not be very satisfying to a person who's looking for a practical engagement with the problem, but the hope is that our report will have some influence because we are a high-level panel and we have, you know, the imprimatur of the National Academy of Sciences and so on. Now, seriously, 
seriously. Um, uh, my answer to you is, I'm not sure I can give chapter and verse on a practical intersection between scholarship on the one hand and reform at the level of, you got your hands on the levers of the mechanism, which way are we going to shift the law? Um, but I can report that, uh, at least from my own part as a scholar, I'm trying to participate in the broad public debate that's going on now that hopefully will trickle down in some way, sorry, to um, practical policy making. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this. Um, my report was somewhat personal, okay? I think it's really important, not that I be the vehicle of that, but that something like that be represented in discussions like this. Um, the people from these communities and who are subject to these forces very seldom have a voice in these kind of councils. And so I hope you'll forgive me if I injected a little bit of that kind of uh, personal account into this. I'm, I regard myself as an objective scholar, but I'm also standing in for people who otherwise wouldn't be heard at all. Thank you. question to that. And, and, and the question is really, so your, your paper is entitled The Responsibility of Intellectuals in the Era of Mass Incarceration. To what extent is the argument you're making the responsibility of African American intellectuals in the era of mass incarceration? Given, given the way you, you, you capture that, 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 this, this critical dilemma, and, and if it is, what should be the responsibility of intellectuals who are not African American? I'm glad you asked me that question, Mark. I don't think, as Americans, that the fact of being African American or not ought to be the primary consideration when asking this question of what are our responsibilities as intellectuals to be, um, you know, uh, to engage in the prophetic kind of social critical activity of seeing what's happening for what it really is, of unmasking the sort of ideological mystification that justifies what is not justifiable, and then of trying to argue against it. I would argue that's everybody's responsibility, everybody who enjoys this incredible life that we enjoy of middle class and upper middle class uh, uh, incomes and prestige and leisure and, and honor that, uh, that we have. And, we are members of the society, and we have responsibilities as citizens. Um, on the other hand, there are probably some kinds of roles that are just more effectively played by African American intellectuals. And to the extent that people are going to put themselves forward in other venues as um, representatives of this community and, and you know, therefore deserving of some consideration or another in virtue of being representatives of this community, then I think they carry a responsibility to you know, acknowledge what some of the problems and the issues are and not to sort of stand outside of and above the messy stuff. You know, you want the benefits, but you don't want any of the, any of the, um, any of the hard stuff. But that, that becomes, you know, that's an arguable point. I mean, a person might say, look, you know, just because I'm black doesn't mean that I am in any way differentially obligated to do anything. It's a racist view to say that a person, in virtue of being black, carries this obligation. So I don't want to tell anybody else how to be black. I'm just trying to do it the best way I can. I hope we can follow up on this, because I think it's actually a really interesting issue. And, and, and I, I, I mean, there, there is, I think, a, a lot of resonance in some of the things you say. And, and the circumstances which are associated with relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians, and in particular, there, there's a very, very complicated, I think, set of issues around indigenous people being caught up in social relations and sets and circumstances which are not of their own making, which create these compelling choices of the kind that you talk about that are destructive and entail a certain amount of sort of culpability. And, and one of the things that that, that promotes for, for people who are not indigenous is a kind of a liberal paralysis about how you, how you potentially sort of respond to it and you veer, you know, from, from sort of one side to the next. And so I, I have these are issues that can, that can kind of, um, we, can, we can return to in the context. Yeah, let me, let me say this, uh, since we're going to return to this. I mean, on the one hand, there's a kind of truth-telling that an insider can engage in that people outside can't because their um, motives will be suspect automatically, and insiders may have a little bit of cover to be able to go into territory that others can't go and maybe carry a responsibility to do that. On the other hand, there's a kind of tokenism that can go on where 
the representative black is saying whatever it is that the conservative wants to have said. You see, even blacks are saying it here. I tried out this person who, you know, will, you see, you see, it's not, it wouldn't be a racist thing for me to say because even blacks are saying it. And, you know, um, I don't know about Australia, but that, that's a role that, uh, you know, I can say with personal experience, uh, that's an occupation that is uh, available to anybody who wants to sign up for it, and it's pretty well paid in the United States. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we do also, um, speaking of, uh, you also mentioned having wine. Thank you. We do have time for one question, I think, if you, if, if you want to ask. Do you want to? No, 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 we... we, we Okay. It was what, uh, just what you were saying, although it's based on experiences in work in the United States, that it really triggered with me some experiences I've had in other countries and where race wasn't really an issue. For example, working in the slums of the beaches of Buenos Aires, there's a perception of any time there's crime anywhere in Buenos Aires, it's because of those people who live in the slums, who live in the beaches. Even though racially there's really no, there might be a few more Paraguayans, but generally speaking, racially there's no difference between them and the most upmarket suburb in Buenos Aires, but they're still there. It's not that they're doing bad things, it's they're bad people. So yeah. there's that differentiation that you were talking about. And similarly, working with gang members in Mexico, which you could say is related to the drug issue in the United States, um, okay. <laughs> but, um, the whole being perpetrators and victims at the same time at 100% true. And there's some observations from Great. other countries that thought were Thank you.